What's up, everybody? I'm here with Nick today from the Funk Hunters. He's in town touring, playing a big show tonight, and he's been nice enough to come and drop some of his time to uh, spill the beans on touring, music, bootlegs, remixes, live bands, all of that stuff's on the agenda. Thanks for joining me, buddy. Thanks for having me. Yeah, cheers, Good bro. Good to be back. Yeah. So um, you guys have, you and, and Duncan started off as a, as a DJ duo. Yeah and have invested tons of time and energy in building a super solid career. Mm -hmm. And I've always been impressed with you guys because you're some of the people that I've seen that have been able to make music a career. And I've seen the blood, sweat, and tears that have gone into it. <laughs> and, um, well, I'd love to talk about some of that, but I, uh, first, I want to talk about the act that you guys currently have. You're in town touring with pretty much a full live band. Yeah. And you're fusing live music with electronic music in a way that is rarely, if ever, seen. And I'd, I'd love to chat about that. So first of all, can tell us about your setup. Like, who's touring with you? What do you have going on? Well, yeah, we have... Technically, we're an eight-piece band, which is... <laughs> it is kind of crazy just, just to think about it, because I was just telling a friend this morning over coffee how last night... Um, I came into Victoria last night, and I saw someone had a ticket for the show, and it said on the front of the ticket, like, the Funk Hunters audiovisual set with live band. And like sometimes life is moving so fast and so crazy and you're on the road and you're playing so many shows that you don't get to stop and think about it. And so it was like seeing it physically printed on the ticket that I had this like, holy crap moment. I'm like, we have a live band. This is crazy. Get ready to party, ladies and gentlemen. The Funk Hunters are going to lay it on you all night long. Yeah, there's eight of us, so Duncan and I, obviously, um, you know, are the backbone of the performance, and then we have um, uh, Peter plays keyboards and synths, um, Smoothie plays the sax, Cole plays the trumpet, Steve plays the guitar, um, Tanya is an amazing female, like, soul vocalist, and then MC Dash from the Root Cellars is our MC, so the six of them, and then Duncan and I, and um, it's a pretty, I think it's a pretty unique performance because it's it essentially the backbone of it is Duncan and I we're still doing a four turntable set and we're controlling all the visuals so there it's a four turntable audio visual set but then with six musicians as well yeah and there's a really neat ebb and flow kind of through the set so sometimes they're all on stage performing and sometimes it's just a song that has a sax solo or it's just a song that has vocals so so it keeps it for us it keeps it it really like ref, like refreshing it's exciting because it's constantly changing and that was part of our motivation when we first started building the concept of like how can we turn what we do into an actual live performance and if we have everybody out there you know and the curtain opens or the lights turn on and we're all there how do you make it fresh 15 20 minutes later yeah you know and i think it's important to differentiate that we're not a band you know we're like we're we're DJs who turned into electronic music producers and visual artists. DJs with, on steroids. Yeah, we're like with a band. So like, I feel like it's important that we don't lose um, the DJ element of it, kind of, you know? So there's like, there's a section in, tonight we'll be doing a two hour set and there's a section in the middle where the band disappears and we still rock a four turntable set for like 30 or 40 minutes before all the band starts coming back out. So this, it's, you know, it's definitely like a fusion. Excellent. Yeah. Sweet brother. Um, I know f when I first saw you performing with live musicians, I saw you guys, I think, at Bass Coast with Smoothie. Yeah. And then from there, it seems you just kept adding people. So where did the initial concept come from, and how did you guys evolve it from there and start choosing who I think the add? simplest thing was just just more as a broader, you know, goal that we always had. You know, I think, I think for anyone who's an artist, it's like, how do you break through that noise, right? Like, how do you stand be different. out? How do you be different? I, I think that's like the most fundamental thing that that you need to figure out as an artist, you know. If you if you want to be noticed, you need to be doing something different. And so for us, we already had this 
one thing going for us that we were a duo and we were like let's figure out how to properly play on four turntables and you know how can we have a set that's a little bit different that's a little more live it's a little more exciting and energetic and once we got that rocking then we were like okay what's the next thing and so the next thing for us was to add some live instruments okay. so we t we've been touring with smoothie who's our sax player for probably three years now and then um you know that started out as just bringing him to some festivals that were around the west coast where we were and um you know got busier and busier last year we flew him around on tour with us across the country and then we started adding in Steve on guitar and brought him to a bunch of festivals with Smoothie last year. And so last, you I mean last year we did a number of festival gigs with guitar and sax. And then once that comfort level was good and we figured out, you know, how to make that work, then it was like, okay, let's let's go big now. Let's put this together into something into like a big band. And mm -hmm. we did um, the first show we did with everyone. I think there was actually like nine or ten of us, but it was some like special guests and cameos we did in November at Celebrities in Vancouver but the first like proper debut of the band was two weeks ago at the Commodore and that was kind of like a dream come true and I think getting that booking at the Commodore Ballroom because you know for anybody who lives in the West Coast that is like our that's like the premier like, venue yeah it's a much. big deal it's like the legendary venue to get to play at and so like once that booking was secured it was what we needed to like go okay booking really helped kick it into gear and so being able to come over here tonight and do the show that's you know it'll be a similar set to what we did at the Commodore a few weeks ago with there's a couple changes but um, it's nice because that you know that that all that hard work is done and tonight we can really enjoy it and yep. do it again yeah. awesome so you've you've amalgamated these people that are touring with you from a technical perspective um, how are you mixing all that stuff together you guys are using Serato yeah. four turntables, and then how do you manage all of the mixing of the musicians live on stage? Yeah, it's been it's been a you know, it's been a complicated thing I would say. And first and foremost, neither Duncan or I have been in bands. You know, like we're not we're not like band members or musicians turned DJs. Like we really before we'd ever even written an electronic song on a computer, we were just DJs. So. So that's been a huge learning curve, just working with musicians. And, you know, I'm proud to say that our musicians aren't DJs in the sense that they're musicians. And a lot of them have their own amazing solo careers and stuff as well and projects that they're working on. So that's like the first thing was just how do we make everything work together? And that's been kind of the most, the hardest part, but the most rewarding part. And then the second question was, do I move to Ableton? <laughs> that's like, that's like the topic that just comes up all the time. but we've kind of built our name and brand on this like four turntable aesthetic and so yeah. i you know maybe in the future i'll move to ableton and duncan will stay on turntables i mean it seems like a, a better idea and especially if we're playing more and more original music it would allow me to have a lot more flexibility with stems but because i know you use ableton live in the studio yeah so i yeah. produce everything in ableton so it would seem like an obvious step but the problem is that uh Tomorrow, for example, we get on a plane and fly to Calgary, and we can't afford, you know, to fly, not right now anyways, to bring eight of us to Calgary for the show tomorrow. I mean, it's going to yeah. be a big show. It's going to be sold out. It's going to no be awesome. No private fun countries yet? yet? Not yet. Oh, man. I need that sponsorship. Yeah. So, but tomorrow, uh, where I'm going with this is that we have to choose, like, how do we still put on an amazing, they want a, it's still a huge show in Calgary tomorrow. They want a live element. So we're going to bring just the sax and just our MC. And... 
if that's the case, then I still want to be on a turn on turntables tomorrow. And so we still want to have right. a four turntable show, but with a saxophone and with an MC. And so at the moment, we're sticking with the four turntable thing. So so you guys just have a do you guys have a sound engineer that yeah. runs the yeah. So for we you? have yeah. So essentially, basically, what's happening? So for all the original songs that uh, we've written with the band, I've bounced out special like VIP versions or dub versions for the shows. And so I'll be playing. A complete song that basically has like the piano and the guitars and the horns and the vocals turned off and then the band's doing that live um, and that's the simplest way to explain it and then most of the instruments go straight out to the sound engineer along with our DJ mix um, yeah. Duncan and I connect our DJ mix together so that we can kind of run our own levels and a lot of what we're doing is live between the two turntable setups and so he'll be adding things on top and I'll be adding things on top Sure. And then in the video side of things, we're running all the video ourselves as well. So we have a video mixer right between us, and we can decide if we want to send 100% of my video up to the screens or 100% of his or a mix of both of them. And so Serato has this brilliant plugin just called Serato Video. I mean, without that, we couldn't do our audiovisual sets. Um, there's way, you know, we've looked at ways of running video through Ableton, but the way that Serato Video handles it is just so awesome. So. Basically, we pre-make, Duncan makes all of our videos. Um, so, f you know, I'll give him an original song, he'll cut a video to it. And then essentially, instead of playing a song in Ableton, I'm actually just, or in Serato, I'm playing the video file. Yeah. Which is awesome. So I can control the video file right from the turntable, just as if it was a song, and you could cut and scratch it, or, you know, whatever you want to do. Um, so 100% of the songs that are being played have a video file attached to them already. So that's like the backing of the video. But then on top of that, Duncan can still grab some other video content and scratch it and mix it in on top. Using, all using Serato. Yeah, all using Serato. And so Fantastic. we can on the fly still add visuals or acapellas or, you know, we've taken like hundreds of acapellas without beats, gone and found the original music videos for them, deleted the audio and stuck the acapella in. So on the fly, Duncan could quickly go grab, you know, a Jurassic 5, what's golden, video and drop it over my track but he's just playing the vocals and then up on the screen behind us you know is the faces rapping yep. so it's allowed us to take you know this the funk hunter set that we've done for years with just the two of us and you know keep that aesthetic keep the same vibe keep the flexibility that we have so we're not stuck in one set list and then still be able to do it and now we just have all these amazing musicians Nice. on stage at the same time yeah wow well what a production it's um, fun it's yeah. the coolest thing we've ever done and it makes me so excited and like i think as an artist you just need to be you need to always be excited and you know there's going to be days when you're on the road when you just aren't stoked on a gig or you feel like you're playing the same songs you've always been playing and like you need to find creative ways of dealing with that but i think the bigger the bigger thing is just to figure out ways to just make yourself excited about what you're doing all the time and so you know, who knows what we'll be doing in two years, but this is like this new thing we're doing now and it's the most exciting thing. I'm picturing thing you're like, done. you're partnered with Virgin Galactic <laughs> and you're up with Richard Branson in space. Yeah, like, SpaceX. Yeah. Yeah, that's our next sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously it took incremental steps to build all this. A lot, of, a lot of you lovely people who might be watching this might be thinking, well, shit, now I need to be putting video with all my stuff I'm, and I need to be writing music and I need to be a DJ. So I know you have a background in video. Does Duncan have a background in video? Can you tell us a bit about yeah. that background and how it was easier for you guys to start integrating that? Yeah, I mean, I before working in music, I worked in film for like about 10 years and produced documentaries and I taught post-production. So we, I was really familiar with that and that's actually how I met Duncan and we worked on video projects together and um, I ran a film school on the West Coast to help manage it called the Gulf Island Film and Television School and I hired Duncan to come up a lot and he used to teach um, some extreme sports video programs and take skate skateboarders out and help them make videos and so we were like really comfortable with video um, but I think the secret like you said is incremental steps you know we didn't we didn't sit down one day and say hey let's start a four turntable audiovisual DJ group <laughs> you know with just, live musicians with live musicians <laughs> and we'll make our own music like that you know I think the secret is really incremental steps. I mean, so for sure we were efficient with video and I would say that me being able to jump into Ableton so quickly and figure things out like really helped 
wasn't because I was efficient with music programs, but I was already really efficient with working with like a non-linear editing system and yep. moving around quickly. And so that totally helped when the yep. day that I decided I'm going to learn how to use Ableton. I mean, it's a total different media, but I, th I think for sure those skills helped. Oh, for sure. And then the other thing is just ease of technology. Like, you know, to someone out there who's thinking, oh, I might want to add video to my set, it's not complicated. Like, the the prep time, sure, if you want to turn your set into an audiovisual set, you know, if you if you can find videos or pre-made videos already, I mean, all you're, all you're doing in your set is just your normal DJ set, and there happens to be video files being played. So, you know, if, if without the technology that's available now, there's, we just couldn't do any of the things we're doing. So even our four turntable DJ sets, like if Serato didn't exist, there wouldn't be a chance to be able to oh, for sure. make edits and music the day of a show and go and play it. So We feel the same way about Warp Academy. Yeah. But two years prior to now, Warp Academy wouldn't have been able to exist because the technology that underlies the yeah. whole platform wasn't there. How crazy is that? Yeah. yeah. We're only in existence today because other companies have built technology like webinars, streaming video, live chat rooms, things like that, that allow us to do yeah. what we do. And incremental steps, right? I mean, you didn't wake up yesterday and say, I'm going to start Warp Academy. I mean, you you worked for years and years building Vespers, you know, and building that name and a solid reputation and teaching and you know, developed a loyal following of students way before Warp Academy ever existed. And I True. think that's like the biggest message for anybody who's sitting at home, who's an aspiring performer, educator, music producer, whatever. Like it's about incremental steps and challenging yourself. And like when you get yeah. comfortable with what you're doing, challenge yourself again. Be like, okay, what else could I do? You know, like I'm sitting here right now going like so frustrated that I'm not playing drums tonight in the set. And at the Commodore, I was like, had this big aha moment, like the day of the show. And I was like, I should have like a Roland PDX or a Yamaha DTX pad with drumsticks so I can play some percussion in the set. So that's my next little challenge, you know, like nice. incremental things. One and then thing. One, one little thing. thing. So thing once I can get that figured out, it won't be in our DJ sets, but for our live sets, it'll give me something else to do. And uh, it'll look great. You know, it'll add another live element for us. And then once you figure that out and you do it three or four times, then it's just easy peasy. You can move on, you know, then what's the next thing you want to add? Nice. Yeah. On stage go-go dancers, are they coming down the pipes? They just show up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're always there. I don't know who calls them. Yeah. <laughs> just parachute in. Yeah. Bam. Sweet. Well, let's talk a little bit about music selection. And I know you guys have hit a chord within dance floors of, of creating this blend of music that's great. You know, you, you hear some people that are hyper technical that create like, you know, super, super technically clean music, but then they, it somehow doesn't work on the dance floor. Mm -hmm. And then you have on the other end of the spectrum, some uh, DJs that might just play like super cheesy, like, you know, pop or electro or whatever. And you guys have found this blend in between of really dance floor driven music that's also recognizable to people who are coming in from different scenes and you guys have built a fantastic following around that. I know a lot of it's been on like remixes, bootlegs and things like that. I just love to chat with you a bit about the style of music that you guys play and your philosophy yeah. on that. Well, I think ultimately at the end of the day it's all about the dance floor. You know, and it's like it's weird it's weird to think about what you do or to like maybe even like diminish your craft to that point but at the end of the day it is about the dance floor and I could name off you know 20 producers right now that I think are you know incredible sound engineers or sound designers have amazing mix towns that make crazy geeky music that I can sit at home and go this is amazing but like I would never play that in my DJ set like what you're like what you're saying so i think there you know at the end of the day at least for us I, you know, i'm not saying that this is what everybody's goal has to be but for us it was all about the dance floor and when we started djing together we weren't music producers and we weren't making videos and so it was about the dance floor and you know what what makes people dance and how do you still be a selector how do you still you know pick music that you like and make people dance and i think like you need to have critical ears you know, I think like that would be my biggest advice is like be critical, be like, you know, rip tunes apart and be like, this is freaking awesome, but this drop doesn't work. Or like, this is amazing, but the mix down is, you know, play stuff, you know, you're up there for an hour or an hour and a half and 
it's not about picking bangers. It's not about picking like the hardest tunes. I think that's like the biggest mistake that a lot of people make. That you're like, this is my hour to shine. I'm gonna pick 25 songs with the craziest drop, and then your set is just gonna be straight bangers, right? Yeah. So for us, it was time. about like our sets have huge ups and downs. Like I want a moment when I'm on the dance floor to have a break or like cheer or clap or you know have, feel like a minute long melodic breakdown and then a big build up. But then also just be critical and you know pick tunes that you're confident in, that you that you think are going to work that you think that the majority of the people can can get down with and you know I think that was definitely the attitude we had from the very beginning and it was also that we were never tied to any genre and so even tonight with our band I mean our set will probably start at around eighty or ninety BPM and from there it'll go all the way up until we hit some banging house music and then it'll drop in a drum and bass and then it'll go down to like 70 and then back up to glitch hop like you know we're gonna we play every genre of music and so it's not about a genre or a tempo it's about I don't know this magical quality that is hard to define that mm. but that's that really is what funk hunting was about like that's where our name came <laughs> from it was about like hunting <clears throat> this specific time, type of music. And, you know, with the internet now, you can go download a thousand songs, you know, in a second, basically. So it's about, like, hunting out that amazing music and trying to put it together in, in a way that tells a story throughout the night. I think that's, that's, like, the biggest part of it. Nice. Now, I know you guys play a lot of stuff that's got vocals, acapellas, and things like that. So in the music that you choose to, to take on, some of it you're, like, rearranging and editing. Mm -hmm. I know you're always on your laptop in between gigs, like, making new cuts of things that you've gotten. Um, tell me a bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, I w we <clears throat> basically every single song we play is, is our own edit. Like, literally every single one. And it just goes back to that being critical. So there's this awesome song, this brand new tune you just got, or a friend sent it to you, or it's a promo, and you're like, this is amazing, but it's five minutes long, or it has this drop in the middle that I don't like, and it gets all squealy, or something. Like, just be critical and change it to make it your own. I mean, we have Ableton on our computers. You can pop it open on an airplane, and you don't have to be writing new music, but you can just quickly edit songs. And so everything we play is an edit, and that lets us, you know, tell the story how we want and uh, so that's that's one thing is like just edit tunes rearrange them put the first drop over there and make the breakdown twice as long and there's no intro take the outro drums and slap them at the beginning you know like it's easy to do that and that's the power that you know you have and it's not like it's not a disservice to the original creator I think that's like the you know the kind of like the story of this new age of technology is like mash things up and turn things around like make it how you want so we totally play other people's music in our sets it's not always original by any means at all and then the second is that often in terms of like what we're doing live normally I'm playing instrumentals and so a lot of the vocals that you hear are actually just live acapellas from the turntable and so Duncan does a lot of like the live sampling and acapellas and then I'll play a lot of instrumentals so so it's kind of like a combination of our own music and then tons of edits and then live lots of live mashups mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you about working with live musicians now I know in the past you guys were had a lot of flexibility within sets where if you wanted to change the order or something you'd be able to do that on the fly working with live musicians now how's that changed your approach to sequencing out your sets in advance and like working on your music yeah I think just yeah way more thought goes into it now and I guess with, you know, the live sets we've been doing, we're definitely married to more of a set list, but <clears throat> the middle of the set is kind of Duncan and I's, you know, solo, so it's, like, tonight there'll be a 30-minute section in the middle of the set where we do a four-turntable DJ set that's, like, fast with a bunch of songs, and so that section is ours to change things up, and, you know, I think every set you play... There's some song in your list that you're about to play and you look out at the audience and you're like, no. Or the opposite, or you're about to play it and all of a sudden this old tune pops in your head and you're like, oh yeah. You know, like I would hate to ever lose that. Like to be stuck to be stuck in a Yeah, like that's like the the live that like that feeling where you're, you know, you're in this optimal zone where you're not thinking about anything else at all and you're just playing music and a song pops in your head and you're like, oh yeah, you quickly grab that, throw it on, and you look over at each other, you're like, oh, nice choice. The ability so, to read a dance floor Yeah, live. so I would never want to lose that, but 
for sure. I mean, the stuff that we're doing with the musicians is pretty set in stone and and also set in stone for them in terms of like the order so that they know and our set, we don't have the band on stage the whole time. So like someone comes out, rocks a trumpet solo and leaves. Someone yeah. comes out, there's like a song with like vocals, guitar and sax at the same time. And then when that's done, they'll take off. And so it is this flow. And so for that, we've been much more married to, to having a bit of order and, you know, organized chaos i guess but but it you know there is definitely much more order to it than we're used to so but yeah. it's also kind of a nice feeling too it's been a bit more relaxing in a sense like it is kind of laid out and we think it's laid out really well so we can still change things if we want and by all means it's not like the set is pre-sequenced so like we can yell backstage like we're skipping that song or you know yeah okay great now with your music, I'm sure your music's had to change. Your originals, right? Yeah. Because if you're writing stuff and you have that many live musicians, the track itself needs to be pretty sparse. Yeah. So how have you been changing your original productions to accommodate that? Um, well, I mean, you you were you said you were going to ask me about um, re like writing bootlegs and stuff too. Did you want to talk about that? Because I sure. mean that that's like really what how I started writing music. So that might be a good place to start because. Um, people always ask, like, you know, what's... No, we pre-sequenced this interview, so it has to go that way. We're not very flexible here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but No, talk about bootlegs. Yeah, okay, well, that's, I think that's a good thing to start with, because that is, by all means, that's how I started writing music. Like, I'm not a musician. I don't play any instruments, and um, I think... You play the MacBook Pro. I play the MacBook Pro, yeah. And um, in, for the most part, up until very recently, like, everything I do is in the box. And... Uh, I don't think that's I don't think it's a bad thing and I you know I'm I'll totally say that to anybody who asks like I'm not a musician but it means that there's an incredible learning curve there and so it's all about those incremental steps right like what is the easiest way to get you on this path to what you want to do and so I had you know this big wake up call we started DJing that I was like I want to start making music but for me to open up an Ableton template and sit there it doesn't matter if I have the best tools in the entire world I'm going to get nowhere at all and so for me, it was incremental steps. Like I started editing tracks for our DJ sets and I was doing that four years ago, five years ago. Like, Duncan, check out this awesome tune. Like maybe if I take the first drop and copy it in the second part, it'll be an instrumental the whole time and there's no vocals and then you could play over it. Like things like that. So I got really comfortable with Ableton without ever writing original music in it by making tons of edits. And from there, I started making remixes and bootlegs. And the beautiful thing about starting a remix or a bootleg is that you can sit down with this you know this classic rock tune or this old funk tune you're going to remix and there's a set of parameters that are already there mm -hmm. that you didn't have to come up with on your own yep. and so i think someone who's in the same boat as i am is going to know what i'm talking about right away and you're very musical so for you it's probably not as much of a concern you can sit down at the blank computer and come up with those parameters on your own and pick a key and come up with a chord progression but for me that was really challenging and still is today so remixes and bootlegs you're like okay there's already a couple parameters right away so you know the tempo range probably isn't going to be too far away from the original depending on how much of a bootleg it is unless i'm just lifting out a sample and then along those same lines I'm probably going to keep things in the same key and use a similar chord progression if not the same one again depending you know how much of a remix it is so that helped a lot because I didn't have to think about those things and I know for me that was like the biggest roadblock in writing music and so I would encourage people to do the same thing and what a great way to just move on and get into the things that are fun and like for me drums bass lines designing bass patches you know that's the fun stuff and chord progressions and dealing with things that are in key and that for me it's getting more fun now but it was not fun yeah it was like the more mathy technical yes yeah. music theory side of things yeah so that was that was like really why um people always why did you make so many bootlegs and i was like well it was out of necessity like i didn't writing original music that was just seemed like a far away thing so we just made tons of bootlegs and remixes and fortunately it worked really well because we loved old classic rock tunes and old funk tunes and soul tunes and, and i think that's one of the pieces that's really accessible about your show is that you play music that people are familiar with already 
but you do it in a completely new way where it's like hard hitting dance floor oriented but there's pieces that people recognize yeah. and bring that familiarity in like there's nothing like being on a dance floor and hearing a remix song that you've never heard before but you know the original yeah and then it's like that special moment right there and it's an edit that you guys have created yeah yeah and it's hard to imagine not having those elements in our set like Right now, the big focus and push is writing original music, and and yeah, we can talk about how that works and writing with the band. But at the end of the, you know at the end of the day, it's hard to imagine not still having some of those throwback nostalgic remixes, and maybe that's just because where we came from, like you know what inspired us to get into DJing and getting into uh, you know the funky break scene, or even 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 drum and bass and house. Like I still feel like. Today, even you go see your favorite producer who has tons of original music and, you know, they can drop a new tune and you're like, yeah, amazing. But when they drop that new remix that that they've, you know, you've never heard and it's a remix of a song that everybody knows that hasn't been remixed a thousand times, like, to me, that's what I remember when I leave the show. It's like, holy crap, they played that, you know, that hip-hop remix or that old rock song or something. Like, there is something cool about your connection to music and how you could hear someone drop a tune that you haven't you know you haven't heard the original in 10 years and then they play some remix and instantly you're brought back to that feeling and you remember the words right away and like you're you're the way that your memory works with music i'm always astounded by like you could mm. you know the radio could suddenly start playing some some horrible song that you've never even listened to on your own, like a Backstreet Boys tune or something that was big on the radio. I listen to them all the time. Yeah, well, don't, okay, I didn't know that was public. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, do you know how it's like a pop song that you've never voluntarily listened to, but you've heard it so many times, your brain's been like conditioned to it, and you actually know the lyrics. And if I was like, hey, Drew, tell me the lyrics, you couldn't remember it at all. But as soon as I play the song, your mind instantly is like, oh yeah, it goes to that spot. Yep, I remember the lyrics. So there's something, there's something like, weird and sciencey happening there and that's how I always feel about bootlegs and remixes so it's it's hard to imagine not still having some of those like I think I think wanting to move forward as an artist and you know evolve right now like for sure all my cards and focus is on original music yeah but I like what you said there I mean I think for a lot of people that might find staring at a blank canvas you mm -hmm. know like a, a new blank project in in live they might find that intimidating because of those exact choices that you said. You know, you need to select a key, you need to select a tempo, you need to build your your palette of sounds, and that, like, in and of itself, stops a lot of people, or they get stuck in that process. So I think, yeah, if you're if you're adapting and learning the environment of electronic music, starting with some ideas, a key signature, uh, you know, a time signature and a key and some melodic ideas of some elements and then working with those and building something mm -hmm. around that can be, it can catapult you ahead. Yeah, and so I, I like, that. like I encourage everybody to do that and like take it one step further, you know, it's all about, it seems like our theme today is incremental steps, but if you're, you know, so if you're going to start by remixing something else so that those parameters are already there, like take it a step further into like the synthesis as well. If it's overwhelming to be like, okay, now I know my key and stuff, but like what kind of, freaking bass line am I gonna make and like how am I gonna synthesize all my drums that are like perfectly tonally in key with the track like just go download a crap load of sample packs and like maybe for your first tune don't physically design anything but you can still learn how to like program MIDI drums and you can still learn how to do your mix downs and how to treat your bass patches just by using samples and that was another thing for me that was a big roadblock like I had this total uh, like I was just so opposed to the idea of using sampled stuff when I first started writing music even though I was making bootlegs and remixes but I felt like I still needed to like write my own drums and I needed to make my own bass lines and I think that if you want to get things done quickly go grab a bunch of sample packs go to Warp Academy and get like the full on template of an entire Vespers song or something and open it up and tinker with all the little pieces in there you know you're just gonna you're gonna learn things so much faster and then it's all about those slow steps. Then you can slowly start taking those things away. Like if you're more comfortable with keys and chords, then you can come. You you can decide, you know, what key your bass line is going to be in and write your own chord progression. And then you can go, okay, today I'm going to try to like really make my own drums. And today I'm going to try to make my own bass patches or nice. make them ahead of time so that you can pull from them when you're writing. Like I think I think it's all about taking this like big scary. I always just talk about the blank Ableton screen. 
you know, like yep. taking that big scary thing and turning it into something that's like fun and easy and accessible for you and everybody's different. So it's about finding like a solution that works for you. Yeah. Nice one, brother. Yeah. That's great. Those are good insights. Um, you ready to move on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I'd, I'd love to chat a bit about the integration of the live band and then move on to talking about your, I know the big project coming up for you guys is getting your own studio and doing a lot of recording and a lot of originals and things like that. So I'd love to talk about this, how the vision for music has changed. Yeah, um, well, like I was saying, I, th I think the focus for us now is to to really put out a lot more original music. And, and it's really like in parallel with this, this band thing. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's going to be a day where we're ever going to stop doing Funk Hunters sets on four turntables and we can fly around the world and do that and go on tour. and. Um, I think the band is something else that just is working complementary with that. And so, um, you know, I'd love to know that in the next year or something that we'll get onto a tour bus and we can go do like a 50 city tour with the band and take all of them with us. Who knows? Like, I think that's the only way it would be feasible because flying around with them just doesn't work. And, you know, I think people who are touring DJs today feel very fortunate that they're not in a band for those reasons. So yeah. sometimes it feels like, are we moving backwards here? Like, I know, I don't think we are. I think it's just, you know, the way we tour will have to change if we're touring with them. But so the goal with the band then would be able to do, you know, close to 100% original sets. And um, I think for the Funk Hunters, regardless of having the band or not, having way more original music is key so so it's an exciting time to be doing these live shows with them because it's meaning that we want to have a lot more live music and there's definitely some sets or some songs in the live set where they're not ours and we've edited them a bit to maybe make room for another instrument space yeah. but you know when you're dealing with a song that's full and it's fully mastered and it's mixed and mastered it's really hard to add instruments on top and so that's just another reason, another motivation to write our own music. So a lot of the original songs we're playing tonight, and there is tons of them, which is, you know, tons of new original stuff, is that uh, we've written it with them ahead of time, and then really all we're doing is just turning off their parts for tonight so that they nice. they play their parts. And yep. so that's just, it's just such an easy way of doing it, and it means that they're already comfortable with it. And a lot of the a lot of the writing process is like, okay, there is the basis or a foundation of a new song. You know, there's like a groove, some awesome drums and some bass patches, and then, you know, we'll call Steve, our guitarist or something, you know, come in and lay down a bunch of guitar licks and we'll just jam with it looping for a bit and like till we really feel and find a sound that was in my head and so he can, you know, come up with come up with an idea on the guitar that suits what I had in mind. But then it won't just be, you know, oftentimes it won't just end up being that recording. So then usually I'll take that, and then I can go back to the studio, nerd out by myself, you know, maybe I splice his guitar into MIDI and then chop it up all over the place. And so oftentimes it's like then we're giving it back to them, saying like, okay, now you need to learn this. this pattern, like it was yeah. you playing it, but like, this is what I've done with it. Now I you need to learn it. that. You need to learn how to yeah. play in reverse and yeah. upside down. Yeah. <laughs> Can you do side chaining reverbs on your guitar? <laughs> yeah. So then, so then they need to relearn the part, and then you know maybe there'll be multiple. If we're you know maybe there's multiple guitar parts, so maybe I'm just turning off the lead part, and then he does the lead stuff live, yep. and the other stuff sits in there. Some backing stuff. Yeah. So that's what's happening with a lot of the music, and um, I mean by all means, I'd say like Pretty Lights is a huge inspiration for us right now because we were just starting on this process when he released his his album, and you know his was like a very specific, very like laborious process going and making all of his own samples and yeah with things. you know with all these session musicians and then printing it down to vinyl and then him sampling it for his music but it's definitely a similar thing that we're doing it we're not really we're not going about it in the same way so um, I would like to try in the future like sitting down with the band and really like coming up with the whole band jamming but at the moment most of the songs start with with me and our keyboard player, he's uh, Peter, he's doing a lot of writing with me. And so we'll really come up with those, um, you know, the chord progressions and the key and some grooves and bass lines. And then usually just one by one, we'll bring the musicians in and say, like, let's figure out, we want to put a sax part here and we want to put a vocal part here. And then I'll take that to the studio by myself and just go crazy on it and geek out. Nice. until we get something that really like and then it's kind of like you've arrived back at you know where I was four years ago making a remix right like I've coming back in the studio and I have all those pieces and I can just 
go crazy having fun with the stuff that I love. And like I love engineering and tweaking knobs and solving problems in the mix down. And I'm not stuck worrying about writing a bunch of brand new stuff. You know, I have yep. all these. You can focus your energy. Yeah. When you've got a lot of material to work with. Well, I know I've heard some of your new stuff because we've listened to it in yeah. here. And uh, I'll have to say, yeah, the organicness of it sounds, it, I mean, with my background, as I used to play keys, I play sax, I love that stuff. I crave it, and mm -hmm. I really like that about Pretty Lights music as well. So hearing you guys go that direction and hearing, like, the beautiful keys and and the roads and, and horns and things like that, I'll have to say it's just it's next-level stuff. It's cool. really, really Thanks. Impressive. Yeah, I think that's, like, the goal is just fusing, fusing this, like, real musical soulful sounds with an electronic backbone i mean that's like the way to describe the stuff we're working on right now yeah and i think it's something that maybe has been missing a little bit in electronic music and i feel the same way in our live sets like you know no matter how much improvisation you can still do on stage when you're playing a song at the end of the day you're playing like a digital file it's literally ones and zeros being pumped out of a computer right then you add someone who has an instrument live on stage and you're like, you're adding humanness back into the music. And so that I think is what we're trying to, you know, we've, we've seen the benefits of that on stage working with musicians over the last few years. So that's what we're trying to do in the studio now is like, I can go and add Ableton swing grooves to things, right? But at the end of the day, it's just never quite the same as when someone lays down something live with some human, human error right yeah. human groove i think that's what's missing in a lot of music there's no there will never be i think a substitute for yeah that little margin for error that makes it human yeah you know and those little subtle variations in groove that you can get when you listen to like a live drummer yeah one of the things i'm obsessed with is i i listen to a lot of jazz in particular i watch the drummer because i'm not a drummer mm. and so for me programming drums is something that i always want to do better at and so I go to jazz clubs and I watch the jazz drummers and I watch what they do and it gives me mad inspiration for what I then will come back and do with my drums in the studio. And you just will never be able to pick up all the nuances that a live musician can make. But then again, the, what the thing that the acoustic musicians lack is like that really like hard hitting, like yeah. engineered sound of like the drums and the bass that you layer on top of that. Yeah. That really is what people feel that impact on the big PA. So it's where I, I think you guys are really just nailing it with yeah. this, this fusion. That you're yeah, it's kind of the most exciting marriage of musical elements. Like, I think, you know, kicks, snares, and bass lines are just, like, we just love big Drums bass. and bass. Yeah, drums and bass, right? Like, that's the electronic side. And I'm just infatuated with old, like, analog saturation. But then taking that and adding in, you know, all these musical elements, I, that's why I always just come back to Pretty Lights as, a, as inspiration. And I don't feel like we're trying to make Pretty Lights music. I just feel like he's the only guy I can think of who's who's has that nailed down. You know, I listen mm -hmm. to his his tracks, and there's certainly a whole team that went into making his album, and it's, he wasn't mixing down his album by any means. But it's still it's still his, you know, it's still his all vibe. his vision and his vibe, and that's what he's managed to nail so well. I nice. think, you know, you listen to the way that his tracks just have this low-end analog, like, warmth to them, and his kick and snare, but riding over top is all these live drums and rides, and it's it's certainly, it's certainly, I think it's inspirational when I listen to his music. I'm like, wow. Totally. Yeah. Well, I like what you guys have done there. The thing I'd like to acknowledge about what you've done is you used it as a source of inspiration without trying to emulate it mm -hmm. really closely. Like, you guys have your own vibe. Your stuff sounds unique, and... That's a trap that some people get stuck in is they, they emulate the people who they're inspired by too closely. Yeah. And then you, you that's a rabbit hole that you can get stuck in. Yeah, and it goes back to what we were talking about at the very beginning of just like, how do you stand out? Yeah. Right? And it's really difficult when you talk about genres because a lot of people associate with the genre. And that's changing a lot now. But back in the day, you'd be like, hey, oh, you're a DJ. Cool. What kind of music do you play? And the answer is always a genre. So you're like, I, I'm a drum and bass DJ. Speed garage. Speed garage or breaks. And so you're like, there's one tempo and like one vibe that I play. But you're just suddenly limiting yourself off the bat. And it's really cool to see that falling apart and changing. That's because you only had plus or minus 8%. Yeah, I understand. guess so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Limited your options. That's true. <laughs> I never really thought of it that way. It's such a simplistic with way of thinking about it. With the tempo ranges we true, can do right? now, yeah. with things like looping, 
Like you can literally like for tempo, I sometimes in my sets I'll do massive tempo changes, 20, 30 beats per minute. And I'll just do it by looping the last measure of mm. a track or yeah. the last beat. And then you can crank or lower the tempo really easily because it's just this repeating pulse. Yeah. And with tools like Ableton and Serato, that's opened up the realm of what we can do and integrate for tempos. And I know what's one of the things you said, you're going to be playing stuff from 70 to 140 yeah. in your sets, right? So you guys are going to span yeah, Even just like, range. you know, when the crowd is with you and they're, everyone's like 100% into it, like it's amazing how much more freedom you do have that you could literally kill a turntable or rewind a track and then drop something that's of a total different tempo, you know, without even having to mix it. So, and I, th I think, I think that's what's been cool about our our audience and our fan base, you know, and the people that support us is that that's what they've come to expect too is just different, you know, all different genres. And that we always joke that it's a journey. Like we're gonna take you on a journey tonight, do a little bit of everything because that's you know that's what's exciting. So, yeah, yeah, sweet brother. I, that keeps us excited too. Nice, which is. That's also the most important, very important part. Yeah. If you're not excited, then you may as well be on Facebook on yeah. your laptop. <laughs> <laughs> Sending emails at the show. Yeah. So I know one of the things you've been really excited about is your new studio. And this is something we've been chatting about because you were trying to debate, you know, do I keep it in my house and keep yeah. it accessible and easy to get to? Or do I find another space? And if I do, how do I find the right space? And I know you've told me you found the right space. And yeah, I haven't heard anything about it yet. So. I, well, we just got it, and um, I actually we're t I'm taking over the lease on Tuesday next week. So congratulations! So that's exciting. But yeah, I mean the whole like working at home and having a studio. There's so many pros and cons, and yeah. um, I always seek out your advice on these things because I admire your your uh, you know diligence and like discipline in working. Because you. you know we're we're at your home studio right now, but. I think that's a really difficult thing for a lot of people because there's the obvious benefits that you wake up and you can just go right to work. But there's also a lot of distractions and a lot of us don't have the amazing freedom to just work on music. We've got meetings and hundreds of emails. And so we decided this year that if we're going to take some time off and we really want to finally release a full length album and work with the band. And so it was like more out of necessity. It was like, okay, we need to separate. We need to separate work and management stuff from music making. And so the first step was to go get a studio. Okay. So we got the studio, which is awesome. And then the second step was we were like, well, if we're going to write an album and, you know, I've been working for like four or five years at my studio at my house, which is which has served me really well. It's been great. And I do have like a dedicated studio room. But I think the next step is is to really go out and get some awesome gear and you know, to be able to get really surgical and mix downs and, and to be able to mix down and master it all, you know, myself. So Keep it all in-house. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, we're making a big investment into our studio this year, which I'm super excited about. I mean, there's yeah. nothing more exciting than new gear, but um, mm -hmm. we're actually, I think, yeah, we're getting the exact same Genelec tops and sub that's behind you and a new desk and um, a whole new, like, similar, very similar to this, like, Prime Acoustic treatment kit. Nice. from Prime Acoustic and uh, that's pretty exciting because I've never actually worked in a treated studio. Yeah, it makes all the difference yeah. in the world, let me tell yeah, you. Yeah, and I think that like, I think a lot of us get, you know, bogged down by gear choices and things and... There's a lot of options out there's there. There's a lot of options and you hear all these it. arguments all the time of like, is Ableton better than Logic and is the sound engine better and is are these monitors better than that monitors and like for the most part I think that it's all not relative. Like, I think you really need to like hone your craft for a bit before you would ever notice the difference of those things. But I find too many people get suckered into thinking that it's the gear and the equipment that makes the music and not the producer. Yeah. You know, it's like you have a you have a fantastic um, driver. It doesn't matter if they're in a Ford Mustang or, uh, you know, a Honda Civic. Mm. It doesn't matter. They're masterful at what they do. They'll maximize the tools. Yeah. You know, if you're a carpenter, does it really matter what brand your hammer is? That's a great metaphor because you kind put, of irrelevant. Put a shitty driver in the best car in the world, you know, and they're going to crash in a second on a race course. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, now that being said, two producers, everything else being equal, with better gear, like an acoustically treated room, really nice monitors, that'll help. But yeah. it's not it's not the first thing to focus on. The first thing to focus on is your yourself. Like yeah. you're you're the most significant part of your instrument, which is you and a computer. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and I think I just reached the point now of where I can finish, you know, a mix down and a master 
on my home studio and sit there and like pretty confidently say, you know, this sounds awesome. There's nothing I want to change. And, but it's taken me years to get to that point. But I know that's not the end because then I could take that mix down into a properly treated studio on monitors that are worth thousands more than mine and listen to it. And suddenly I'm hearing, you know, hearing frequency ranges that I was missing out on or, you know, thinking that something was like quite lush and wet and it's really not or, uh, you know, the differences in, in your room, like there could be amplitude spikes and frequencies or spots that were missing. But, but I'm glad that, you know, I worked as long as I did uh, before going out and building like a really badass studio because I don't feel like it would have been necessary. Like I really needed to wait till I got to the point of where I'm like fully confident in my mix downs and my understanding of engineering. And so now I'm like, okay, we'd be stupid not to go invest in some really nice monitors and treatment, especially if we're going to like put our heart and soul into writing an album. So, so we're going all out. We're moving nice. into a new studio. We're building a studio. I'm going to take some time off from the road and work on what I hopefully will be an album, but I don't know. We'll see what comes out of it. Nice. Yeah. And are you, how long are you going to take off to do that? Well, that's the hardest part. <laughs> I mean, music is, music's our full-time job and, you know, we tour for a living. So, um, I don't know. Like, I think, I think this spring I'm going to take some time off and, uh, for April and May and just play like a gig or two here and then here and there. And then the summer is, you know, that's music festival time. Yeah. Wouldn't you miss that. Busy. Wouldn't miss that in a million years. So, so hopefully like, hopefully this spring will be spent really getting everything set up, get the new studio built and start working on, get a bunch of new music ready for the summer and then go back in the fall. Like I'm really hoping that the fall and the winter we could find a way just to take time off. So sweet. Yeah. I'm hoping that, you know, we'll, I think we're probably going to try to launch like a crowdsourcing campaign of some kind for the album and maybe let that dictate how much time we can take off, you know? Yeah. I think there's something incredibly scary but rewarding about this concept of crowdsourcing music cuz it's really like you putting yourself out there and then your, you know, supposed I hate calling them fans, but it's your fan base then dictating to you like, yeah, we'll empower you to make an album like we want you to do it, we want to hear it and we've never done that before. We've never asked for that kind of help. So I think it, it's kind of scary to think about. But it also could be rewarding. I mean, how much money do you actually need to make an album when, you know, we have all this gear and we have a studio? Like, you know, yep. really we just need, you know, enough capital to kind of take some time off from the road and pour ourselves into an album. And so I think that's I think that's the route that we're going to go. I think nice. it sounds like the, the best route. And it's just so cool you can do that today. I mean, we have a lot of friends that just finished some very successful crowdsourcing campaigns for their album and it was really like touching to see how well it worked for them I mean Opio just finished his album and by all accounts his pledge campaign was a total success and we were just down in Australia with a bunch of those guys and, and Dub Effects just did the same thing for his new album so nice yeah super sweet and then it's very much like they're you know they're powered by their fans not you know not some record label deal or management contract or something I like yeah. that. I like that. In the day and age that we have this technology now that allows us to connect with the people that love and support our music, we can do things like that. Yeah. And we should. And it's the most like democratic way of funding music that I could think of. It's like, it's incredibly like powerful, really, right? Like if there isn't, I mean, I think it, you, re, you still need to go out there and like build a loyal following and like you need to have supporters and so it's going to be quite difficult if you're launching a new project or don't have music out i mean it's not like the end-all be-all solution for everybody i think then maybe there's better methods for making music and putting it out there but but if you have a following no matter how big or small just if you have like a dedicated following then putting you know kind of like reversing the power there and putting it in in their hands that's really democratic because they're basically voting and saying like, yeah, I'll give you $10 now in advance of your album. And the cool part that I found is that, I mean, who are we kidding? Music's free everywhere, right? And even if it's a friend's album or something and you're in a hurry and you're on the go, like the first place that I would go to get music is to download it from somewhere. It's just the truth. And, but if I come across someone's campaign that I know the money's going to them 
and I'm like, yeah, like I really want Drew to make an album. That'd be amazing. Like I could afford to give you 15 or 20 bucks right now. It feels like you're a part of it, and it's you're not just going out to the store and buying a piece of plastic that half of the money is going to a distributor and a record label. So, totally. Yeah, that that's exciting, and I think that's like a new thing that's kind of like sweeping the music world in the last couple of years. Nice. Well, I know we have to get you to sound check for your gig pretty soon. Gotta do it. But I'm gonna ask one last question. Yeah. Um, you guys, um, I know within BC are, if not the, some of the most successful touring artists as far as electronic musicians, which is killer because you guys are also very young. Yeah. And uh, we, we've been talking back and forth about you doing a course on the music business at Warp Academy at some point. Yeah. But the downside is you're too freaking successful <laughs> to take time off and do a course. So condense that, all the ideas you have down in that course into a 30 second response for me, please. Whoa. <laughs> no, tell, I just loved if you could share some information on what you guys did to build your career. Was it as simple as finding the right booking agent or was it uh, releasing tracks for free? Was it combinations of these things? You know, like what are some of the some of the top things that you guys have done? Obviously, being different, but yeah. what are some of the other things you guys have done to help to build your career? Well, yeah, I mean, being different and standing out. I think that's the one thing we already touched on. But I think that's important at various levels, right? So, like, start in your hometown, right? Don't take on the world at once. And so, we've always been supported by a community that backed us. And but I also feel like we earned like we earned that community you know we built that following and so start in your hometown and then slowly branch out i think i think is you know it's one step at a time and is one of the i know you guys have hosted and promoted a lot of your own shows yeah and was that uh, a key part of that it's like totally. actually I mean, we like don't do that anymore being the but promoter yeah we don't do that anymore but i think i think there's a lot of myths and conceptions into you know touring and how much money you make and you know the reasons and how it happens and how it works and you know I think uh, Nick there just made this awesome blog post it. about about touring and about uh, you the know real financial picture yeah and it was just it was interesting for someone like him to do it because he for those of you that don't know he his last release it was almost an album but it was like an eight track EP came out on Skrillex's label Osla and so people would be quick to say that he's made it you know so he was like an authority to speak on this but then a lot of people were quite like taken aback by his numbers and he was just kind of saying like here's all the money that came in from the album but here is the little chunk that I got and then he used one of his US tours as, as an example and was like here's all the money that I made on tour but here is a little chunk I got because of the money that was spent on like management agents hotel rooms and flights yeah. and a lot of people I found myself on there like defending him the last couple of weeks because a lot of people were like that's bull like you don't pay for your own flights and you don't you know you don't pay for this and that and I think there's a lot of misconceptions out there and yeah I guess what I'm getting at is that you need that community to support you both in terms of like fans of people who are going to buy your tickets and come to your shows so figure out a way to engage with your fans and like be sincere you know but also your like network of peers of like friends and producers and you know Nick totally was saying in his post it was half funny but also incredibly true of like when I have a day off I go sleep on someone's couch yeah. and it's like so that's what I'm getting back to is in the beginning we booked tons of our own shows because you know you scratch my back I'll scratch yours so you know we built a following in our city it allowed us to be able to do events and bring in our favorite DJs but then also hit them up six months later and say I'm gonna be out on your side of the country and we have a gig here but we don't have a gig here and then they're like oh yeah you brought me in for that awesome show I'm sure I could help find you a show and I think that kind of relationship is so important to growing your you know your brand, your business, your music, because it works the same way with music, it works the same way with remixes, it works the same way with record labels, with blogs, you know, it's really about like building relationships with these people, like I'll do a remix for you if you do a remix for me, like I'll introduce you to this label because you helped get me on this label, I'll introduce you to this promoter, like I think the mistake is going out there feeling competitive, you know, feeling like you're trying to make it on your own and the reality is that you know it's 2014 I think those like traditional music models that a lot of bands you know were fortunate enough to get and in some cases unfortunate enough to get but these like phone calls like you've made it we'll take it from here you know like we've got a management team a publicist a record yeah. label booking agents in every city like I mean 
sure lots of us now after touring for years you know we have agents and managers and things like that but we certainly built all of that before they ever came along and so really i think like build a community that believes in you and and believes in your music and i think the hardest question then is how do you do that yeah and like that's what i think that's what you need to figure out and it's unique for everybody but um well we hope you'll do that course yeah i mean off the bat i would say like you know how do you reward your fans give out free music like some people are incredible at leveraging the power of fans inviting them into studio sessions you know constantly running contests and giveaways with them like inviting them backstage for meet and greets like things like that like really solidifies you know your relationship with fans and if you're going to move in this direction where fans are going to fund your music then that's so much more important than if you were going in this old traditional avenue of where a record label was going to give you an advance and they were going to pour money into like a publicist and a marketing campaign and sell your music and that's still an awesome method if you can get those deals today but they're few and far between and more often than not you're the one that's like making those decisions so that would be my two cents nice yeah sweet brother well let's wrap up there thanks so much for joining us thank Nick. you sir thanks for sharing yeah. the knowledge everybody appreciates it and um if you haven't seen the funk hunters yet check them out and they'll probably be in a town near you very soon peace thanks drew <laughs>